Uh, today is Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. This is the Senate. Oh, there you go. This is the Senate uh, Finance and Transportation Committee. Uh, and uh, we have, it looks like, five bills on the agenda. Before we get started, uh, Mr. Woolrich, uh, would you please take the roll? Chair Newman. Present. Vice Chair Jasinski. Here. Senator Dibble. Senator Carlson. Present. Senator Coleman. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Johnson Stewart. Here. Senator Kent. Here. Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator McEwen. Senator Osmick. Here. Senator Pratt. Here. Senator Dibble. Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Will. Uh, quorum is present. Uh, we will begin with the first bill, which is Senator Lang's bill, 3680. Senator uh, Lang, I understand that you have an A1 author's amendment, and I'm not sure if you know this or not, but there is an oral technical amendment that's also coming. Uh, Are you aware well, of the Thank oral you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the discussion has been had. However, I have not actually laid eyes upon the amendment. Um, Okay. Uh, you, are you talking the A1 or the oral amendment? Either. Either. Uh, can we get Senator Lang a copy of his A1 amendment? Thank you. Now, Senator Lang, as I understand it, on your A1 delete all, line 120, um, there would be an oral amendment to where it says the commissioner must not, and we would add suspend or, so that it re reads the commissioner must not suspend or revoke. And uh, Ms. Stengel, I, I would assume that the proper motion would be adopt the oral amendment first. You can incorporate it. You can incorporate? Okay, we'll incorporate it. Uh, 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 Senator Jasinski, would you uh, move the author's amendment A1 and incorporate the oral amendment in your motion. I can offer the A1, but I don't have the oral motion. Okay, the oral, the oral motion to be incorporated in the A1 is on line 120. One second, please. 120 of the bill. After the word not, insert suspend or. So that line would read, the commissioner must not suspend or. On line number 1.20 on the original bill? On the A1 amendment. Okay. Line 120. Okay, I'm there. After the word not, insert suspend or. So that it would then read, the commissioner must not suspend or okay. revoke. Uh, Mr. Chair, I had moved the A1 amendment with the oral uh, amendment uh, on line point 1.20 after not insert suspend or on that line, and then it would read revoke the, after that. Okay. Uh, to Senator Jasinski's motion on the author's amendment A1 as uh, orally uh, changed. All those in favor of the A1 amendment as changed. Uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The A1 uh, with the oral amendment incorporated is adopted. Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, <clears throat> members and Mr. Chair. I think you can uh, understand how the I appreciate the work of both the department and the committee uh, as we've uh, kind of progressed through the, this, what I was going to, label as a short bill to begin with has now become a little longer. Uh, and I think that is uh, amenable, amenable to both the agency and hopefully the committee. Uh, me members, 
I, I can say that in, in my years here at the legislature, oftentimes uh, what we do in, in, with good intent uh, takes a little while to, to come out in the wash. And how this came out in the wash is according to Senate file 3680, which I have before you today, uh, is that uh, not too, too awful long ago, I believe it was uh, around 2017, 2018, when it came to the real ID conversation, uh, we put protections in place for uh, some, some individuals so that uh, records and DVS services couldn't be rapidly looked up or again and again. I think there was some high profile cases where we uh, saw some of those incidents happen. So we as legislature reacted to that and we put a law in place. Uh, tough thing about that is that law was rigid. Rigid in its enforcement, rigid in its, in its uh, the way it was handled. So. Uh, the way that played out in my district was we had a, a, a small uh, deputy registrar that uh, was quite a distance from other deputy registrars. Uh, they went through a legitimate business purpose, uh, which I would say is putting tabs on another uh, employee's vehicle at that uh, deputy registrar. Uh, they were uh, fine, notified, fined, uh, received re revocation of their license. So. Um, this bill is an attempt to try to fix that, try to amend that, try to make it uh, a little more streamlined. We're gonna put uh, some protections in place upon our protections is, is really the, 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 the penultimate of the bill. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I guess I, I would stand for questions. Um, hopefully uh, we, can, we can put this bill forward and I know this is part of a larger package uh, to, try to try to fix some of the things we messed up along the way. So. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. And I forgot to indicate uh, that Mr. Zhang is in the uh, room, and at any time that uh, you wish to testify on any of these bills, Mr. Zhang, just l let me know and we'll bring you up to the testifying table. Okay. Uh, members, any questions on Senator Lang's uh, bill 3680 as amended? I am not seeing any. Uh, Senator Howell, this bill... Senator Osmick, this, uh, this bill, uh, 3680 as amended, uh, has to be uh, re-referred to the State Government Committee. Would you pose the amendment, um, please? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the Senate files 3680 as amended be passed and be re-referred to the, government, or the Committee on State Government. All those in favor of Senator Osmick's motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The uh, bill is passed and you are on your way to state government. Well, thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Next on our agenda is uh, Senate file number 3581, uh, Senator Newman, to your bill. And I understand you have an A2 author's amendment. Would you like to move the A2? So moved. So all, moved, uh, Mr. Chair. All those in favor of the A2 amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. A, A2 is now uh, adopted. Senator Newman, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is uh, yet another one of the uh, bills that is a spin-off uh, of the uh, Driver and Vehicle Services uh, Report. In this particular bill, Senate uh, File 3581, um, uh, it uh, is in response to one of the recommendations that uh, will allow first full service providers to fulfill requests and receive fees for providing copies of driver driver's records, crash reports, vehicle records. And um, uh, if uh, members have any questions, uh, uh, Ms. Stengel is prepared to walk through the bill itself uh, if you so desire. But that is, in a nutshell, the, uh, the bill. Thank you, Senator Newman. Any questions on the bill? 
Would anyone like staff to go through the bill line by line? <laughs> Seeing none, <laughs> any comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Newman, you would like to make a motion. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would move that Senate File 3581, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Civil Law Committee. Senator Newman moves Senate File 3581, as amended, pass and be re-referred to the Civil Law Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, those opposed aye. Say, all those opposed say nay. Motion carries. While you're at the testifier stand, Senator Newman, Senate File 3582 is our next item, uh, the driver's license expiration extension and application process modification. Senator Mr. Newman. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kent. Real quickly before we move on to this next one, because it was a question that came up in my mind late on the previous ones, and it refers to both of them. So I know in the past you've discussed that we're going to ultimately lay all these over and deal with them sort of as a comprehensive issue. I know some of them have to go to other committees like that last one did to civil law. It will come back to us. Is that still your intention for these bills, Mr. Chair? Senator Newman. That is correct, Senator Kent. They will all come back. And uh, the bill that we are about to take up is sort of the main bill. And they, they will all come back. Uh, I suspect that they will undergo some change in the other committees. And then we'll repackage it when they come back. Thank you. Thank you. And Senator Newman, I also understand you have an author's A8 amendment. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this is also an author's amendment. I would offer the A8 delete all. Senator Newman offers the A8. Any questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Senator Newman, to your bill. Mr. Chairman and members, I think on this one I will ask Ms. Stengel to walk through the sections of the, uh, uh, the bill as amended that um, hasn't had a bill spun off so that you are aware of the sections in the A8 that uh, you are considering uh, uh, as we move forward. And this bill will be laid over and, and held here. But there's a number of sections uh, that uh, remain in the main bill. And if Ms. Stengel could just uh, give us a real uh, brief explanation as to which sections uh, and uh, what's incorporated in them. Thank you, Senator Newman. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Looking at the A8 amendment, Section 1, you'll see in a variety of bills because it's a term we use a lot, uh, and that's full service provider, and that's somebody who is both a full service driver's license agent and a deputy registrar. Uh, we can skip over sections 2, 3, and 4. Those are all in one of the bills we just heard today that got sent to civil law. Section 5 is the filing fee bill that we heard last week. Section 6 is unique to this bill. Um, this allows individuals um, deputy registrars or the state to provide information about vehicles um, over the phone to the owner of that vehicle. Uh, section 7 is a spin-off bill. Uh, section 8 is again the definition of a full service provider. Section 9 is a spin-off bill for the 8-year driver's license. Section 10 is the filing fee bill. Section 11 is unique to this bill. And it does a couple of things. It requires the commissioner to establish a pre-application process for real ID. Um, and that mirrors the current process where you can sort of plug in your information and it tells you what information you have to bring with you to your in-person appointment. Um, the real change here is the commissioner must provide a link to the pre-application website at the time someone schedules an appointment for a real ID, a driver's license or ID card. Section 12 is a filing fee bill. Section 13 is the eight-year driver's license bill. Uh, Section 14 is unique to this bill, and it requires the commissioner to publish the driver's manual on the website. This is already current practice. Um, and then a new requirement is that the commissioner must publish study support materials uh, that individuals can access for free to help them with written, uh, the written exam and the skills exam. Section 15 is the, the eight-year driver's license provision. Section 16 has to do... Um, with the bill, Senator Lang's bill we just heard. Section 17 is unique to this bill and it talks about some of the exam station issues. 
um, the current requirements to have exam stations either in every county or adjacent county is stricken. The requirement to have a test within 14 days is stricken and that's replaced with some new language. Uh, one new requirement is that the commissioner must ensure that there are 40 or more exam stations throughout the state. And then the commissioner must provide real-time information on the department's website about the avail availability and location of exam appointments so people can easily see where, when and where tests are available. Section 18 is a bill we'll hear uh, in a bit today about new resident driver's licenses. Section 19 um, has a couple of blanks in it, uh, and this is unique to this bill. This is the fee um, that somebody has to pay if they have to take their um, written exam or their skills test a third or subsequent time. Right now the fees are at 10 or 20. Um, there are blank amounts. Uh, the theory, as I understand it, is to increase that amount to deter the need to for so many retakes. Section 20 is a eight-year driver's license provision as is section 21. Section 22 is unique to this bill and it provides um, statutory appropriations to DPS that are annually appropriated um, for an unspecified amount per um, mail transaction or per um, online transaction. And the idea there is that these um, this will help pay for the department's expenses in fulfilling these that sort of fluctuate over time and the statutory appropriation at that set amount um, should help to level that out for them. Section 23 is a filing fee bill. Uh, section 24 uh, was the Senator Housley bill we heard the other day about digital documents. Section 25 is the DNR the, uh, registration replacement system. That was the bill we heard last week. And section 26 is unique to this bill and it has a whole bunch of recommendations from the report um, and encourages uh, the department to implement the various recommendations made by the report and then to report back to the legislature on whether they've been implemented, they're being implemented, or, or um, if they won't be implemented with an explanation. And then um, that report must also include the commissioner's plan for exam station locations, including how many and where they will be. Uh, and then, unless otherwise provided, everything's effective August 1st of this year. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, uh, members, if, if we could go back to section 19 and section 22, those are on pages 17 and 19. Uh, those are the two sections where we have an unspecified amount for a fee, and, uh, and I think that we're going to need some guidance from DPS on what to insert in there, but I just wanted to offer an explanation as, as to why you're looking at a blank uh, fee there. Uh, is it, I don't know yet. <laughs> so we will be inquiring of, of that. I, I, I see that Mr. Zhang is listed as a testifier on this. I don't know if he wishes to come forward or not, but uh, I, I will tell you, members, that uh, what I am using as a guide on uh, this bill is the summary that Ms. Stengel has put together uh, on the, the uh, bill, and uh, I'll try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Senator Newman. Uh, Mr. Zhang, would you like to testify? Mr. Zong, I think you know the, the routine. If you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and state your, who you're with, proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division, happy to be here again today. Um, thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, share some thoughts on this bill and First, I want to thank Senator Newman for taking the time to review and put some of these changes from the Independent Expert uh, Review Report. Um, we certainly see that there are, are lots of opportunities and, and we appreciate this partnership and the collaboration that we've, that we've had on this effort. Um, in general, DVS is, is, um, is open to the recommendations made in this, uh, um, in this bill. Uh, we do, uh, there are specific items, uh, or I'm sorry, 
can I restate that? Uh, we, DVS does not oppose uh, removing knowledge test requirements for out-of-state drivers. Uh, we don't oppose changing online and mail-in transactions to a direct appropriation, and in fact, we believe that that would, that would have eliminated our deficit uh, request had we had this opportunity to build directly those transactions back to this appropriation. Uh, we don't oppose um, full service providers to provide copies of records to customers. Uh, we will, I will add that I think it's really important that we have uh, some ability to audit and review the transactions to ensure that taxpayer, or I'm sorry, customer data, taxpayer, it's from our previous life, uh, it's hard to get that vernacular out, um, that we're protecting customer data. Um, uh, we don't oppose that debit registrars are being, uh, be paid a fair uh, fee for the transactions they complete. Um, we don't oppose that uh, making the, uh, the pre-application uh, for the real ID more available. Um, we'll just note that uh, that language is not necessary for this. We, we can make some of these changes and, and we're happy to look at what the system can do already. Um, uh, and then we don't oppose that uh, for con uh, conducting a report on future technologies that will impact DVS. I think this is, we're always open to looking at new opportunities and, and do, doing more with what we have for our customers. Um, I, we do want to share some concerns. We have about one section of the, of the bill, and that's uh, with the fee sharing uh, for online and mail-in transactions. Uh, these online and mail-in transactions are conducted entirely by state employees through state processes, and um, uh, th there's also concern about the general health of the revenue account um, in the future years because uh, th these the revenue accounts for both the driver and the vehicle services operating accounts um, come directly from these appropriations and funds uh, all the all the services that DVS provides. Um, we do we we have received a request for a fiscal note and um, we we plan to have all those revenue numbers uh, in that fiscal note um, and I think it's due on the fourteenth and we're looking like that we should be able to provide those numbers by then. Uh, this is a very large bill, and it definitely requires a lot of uh, staffing and programming changes. Um, DVS is happy to continue working with this, uh, with this bill on the language and effective dates to ensure a smooth rollout. We also want to make sure that stakeholders have an opportunity to engage in the conversation. Um, we certainly have a lot of business and customer stakeholders that would be interested in some of these changes, and some of these are larger changes. Um, so we, we hope to have uh, enough time to engage those, those customers and those partners um, as we implement some of these changes. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zong. Any questions for, Sen or for Mr. Zong is here? Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zong, for your presentation. And the um, question I have for you is, uh, is the special revenue account. When you say the general health <laughs> of the special revenue account, uh, is there an amount? Where is it at today? Is there an amount that you would like to kind of keep in there? Because the whole purpose of that account is to pay for the services. So it isn't just the money go in like a savings account. This is to cover um, these kinds of things that are in this bill. Can you just address what you mean by general health? Mr. Zong. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, yes, so the, the bill, the language proposes that some funds would be um, Directed to uh, an appropriation, which will then be divvy, which will then be divvied out to full service providers, and uh, our concern is that uh, those amounts, as stated in this in this uh, proposal, will be significant. We will we will be providing those numbers in in our fiscal note uh, response, so that that data will be made available on what our revenue estimates are. Um, when we do our as we look at online transactions and mail-in transactions, those, the number of those types of transactions are increasing significantly. And uh, the concern is that it, 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 it's a significant amount of, of, of um, funds that would not, be made, would not be available in that operating account should we deviate them. Um, I'm certainly happy to, to share more, once we have that data, share more and talk more about the data. Follow up, Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, I appreciate uh, concern about that, but I'm concerned about the health financially of our deputy registrars. Because right now, the state is taking a big chunk of money and they are providing the services without compensation. So let's be fair about what we're dealing with here. So what I don't want to do is 
focus on the state pot of money and all that stuff, and then our deputy registrars are out there providing direct customer service and the uh, and the state account is nice and healthy. I want to see all of them uh, properly treated, and I look forward to that fiscal note. But let's be sure that we remember too: the deputy registrars are putting a lot of effort, and many people, when they need help, they go to that counter. They're not going to drive down to St. Paul to talk to you. They're going to come into their local deputy registrar, and that value and that service deserves compensation. So I look forward to your fiscal note. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to follow up on, on that as well. Uh, we've been uh, having these meetings for almost six years that I've been in the Senate now. Uh, we went through Minlars, we went to Mindrive, uh, we've had no fee increases. Uh, we've talked uh, many times about how crucial these deputy registers are to the whole system. And it's a public private partnership and how crucial these local deputy registers are. If it's a local entity, either a city or a county, or a private deputy register that is doing that, uh, we've heard time and time again of how crucial, how important these deputy registers are. A lot of times someone will start a transaction online, not be able to finish, go to their local, local deputy registers and finish the transaction. Uh, many, many other calls and, and all kinds of things that go on and, and they've not been compensated. So again, based on an expert independent review, they are recommending us to have this 50% share, and I think it makes all the sense in the world uh, to do this. So I'd like to abide by the uh, review and continue on with that. We've had that discussion before, so again, I think it's uh, something that is definitely needed. It's probably way past due. Uh, uh, more and more are being shifted to online and things like that, and our, our deputy registers are losing uh, that revenue, uh, but they're continuing on to do all the services. So I would echo Senator Kiffmeyer's uh, concerns over that and hope we would abide by what the uh, expert review has showed us that we should do. So, any more comments from you, Mr. Zong? Yes, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, DVS continues to support that uh, deputy registrars are a valued business partner and they should be fairly compensated for the work they provide. Um, can, and can I, if you don't mind, add uh, just one thought on, on the fees as Senator Newman uh, was discussing uh, for the retakes. I know this is a little bit off topic, but I, I wanted to include this in my original testimony. Um, so the fees for for general for re, for that third and fourth retake, you know, there are questions about what that amount would be, and and um, you know DVS is, is happy to provide some thoughts on that. Uh, we'll need to look at some of the data to see how what what those numbers look like and and what fee would make sense. Um, it's hard to tell if a fee will, will change that behavior and what that what amount would be that behavior changing point. Um, but we're happy to provide some thoughts on that. We, I don't have any immediate thoughts right now. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Zong? Uh, Senator Carlson. Okay. Uh, then I think we have one more testifier, uh, Mr. Pat Benner from AFSME. And then we'll go out to comments or any questions from Members. Hi. Mr. Benner, please uh, state your name and who you're affiliated with and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Pat Benner, and I'm a legislative representative for AFSCME Council 5. Uh, we represent 43,000 employees in Minnesota, including staff at uh, the Department of Public Safety and Driver and Vehicle Services. Uh, we want to thank Chair Newman for carrying this legislation, uh, and we share his desire and commitment to ensure that DVS is an efficient and successful department. Uh, we also want to express our thanks to Mr. King and his team for uh, this expert review. They were, they were here last week. I don't see them here this week, unfortunately. Uh, so we are very pleased to support various uh, provisions of this bill. Uh, we enthusiastically support the inclusion of the uh, IER's recommendation to consider improvements uh, for the security of deputy registrars and DVS facilities, uh, as well as training for de-escalation and negotiation techniques. Uh, the governor has proposed that DVS receive $1.6 million over the, uh, this biennium and next uh, in his supplemental budget uh, to uh, install security cameras, uh, and we'd request that the chair consider making that uh, amendment to his bill. Uh, there are also, sorry, uh, we do have some challenges with uh, MinDrive as well as the issues of operating these public sites uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and that led to quite a bit of frustration directed at DVS staff, particularly at exam stations. 
Uh, we certainly understand the frustration that members of the public have, and we also want everyone to receive uh, the correct services in a timely and respectful manner. Uh, that being said, our members uh, deserve to be safe. Uh, if a member of the public threatens physical violence against workers that are not to blame uh, and are already being worked to the bone, uh, those people need to be held accountable. Uh, we are broadly supportive of other provisions of the bill, including but not limited to uh, increasing license fees, uh, looking at ways to reduce exam retakes, tracking the pass rates for driving schools, and expanding pre-applications. Uh, many of these proposed changes are necessary to modernize DVS and to make the lives of staff easier, uh, and we are grateful for their inclusion. Uh, in particular, we support taking a look at the pass-fail rates uh, for driving schools because driver preparedness is among the biggest factors uh, driving the backlog in Class D and CDL licenses. Uh, we could also be supportive of some of the changes to the filing fees for uh, mail-in transactions and the creation of a full service provider account and how exactly that money is divvied up between uh, deputy registrars and uh, DVS. Uh, we would just need to see the fiscal note, uh, but we do have a, we do share some of the department's concern about just making sure there is enough for both deputy registrars and DVS uh, since both are performing the same functions of the government and need to both succeed in order for us to all get timely services. Uh, then DVS, like so many other departments and employers, is having a tough time hiring and retaining workers since there is a really tight labor market. Uh, and it's also very demanding work just because of the sheer quantity of license exams to complete and vehicle registrations to process. Um, steps that improve the, the department's ability to hire a full complement of staff are certainly welcome. Uh, we do have some concerns about the bill. Uh, we are opposed to the inclusion of the report on third-party testers for license exams. Uh, so we firmly believe that some services must be performed by the public sector uh, in order to protect their integrity, and administ administering road tests is among them. Uh, part of maintaining some of the safest roads in the country uh, means ensuring that our young drivers are ready to be on the roads. Uh, we feel that the best course of action is to make sure that everybody that scheduled a, schedules a test takes it, uh, provide access to an affordable driving school so that everyone shows up ready to pass their test on the first or second try, and fully staff the department so people can get a test in a timely manner where they live uh, so we can get behind this waiting six months and driving to, you know, up to 200 miles to take a test. Um, we acknowledge the need to make this department more modern, as well as others, uh, but we are also dealing with a worker shortage. Uh, workers that could be displaced uh, by these changes uh, must have an opportunity to receive retraining to fill vacant roles within DVS or find equivalent work uh, in another department so they can retain their seniority, their pension, uh, and their health care. It is absolutely critical for these workers uh, and could also help address the problem of short staffing across many state agencies and also while Director Zhang was testifying, I thought of one other thing. Uh, we are concerned about the new language for the number of exam stations, uh, but that is more particular to in the metro area. Those exam stations are currently at seven days a week, um, and people's schedules go from Monday through Friday, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, or Wednesday through Sunday, and we are just curious to see how uh, that language could possibly affect the greater Minnesota DVS exam stations uh, and if they would also have to go to seven days a week or if that would require a contraction uh, within the metro. And uh, lastly, I just want to remind the committee that our members at DVS uh, have, been, have been working in overdrive uh, for the past three years. Um, the worker performing road exams uh, only stopped for a couple of months uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic and uh, throughout the pandemic, DVS actually increased the number of tests performed uh, to well beyond pre-COVID levels. Uh, that meant overtime, later hours, working weekends, and now an indefinite shift to being open on weekends uh, in the metro area. Uh, these members just need a significant investment into their jobs, uh, not only to fill currently vacant positions, uh, but also to expand the overall number of examiners uh, in the metro area and statewide and possibly even to open additional sites. Uh, without that investment, uh, we feel, unfortunately, that we are being set up to fail. 
Uh, I, again, want to thank Senator Newman, and thank you all for your consideration of my comments, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Benner. Questions for Mr. Benner while he's at the testifier stand? Thank you. Senator Kefmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this sense of um, your last little bit about being set up to fail, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? Mr. Benner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, yes. Um, so, of course, right before the pandemic, I'm sure many of you remember of how widespread the, the news was about this backlog, particularly in uh, Class D tests. Um, so DVS took several steps to really increase the efficiency of that, and that meant working a lot of additional hours. And they made really good progress. But that being said, we're still falling behind because there are so many people that require taking tests, and there just hasn't been the level of investment necessary to catch up, um, it, particularly in the metro. In greater Minnesota, it is getting better. But I mean, it's just they're being worked very, very hard, and it's tough to retain people that are being worked that hard for that long. I, I hope I'm clear, uh, Senator. Sarah Kiffmeyer. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I, th I think so. I think that's a matter of um, you're needing more staff so you can cover more. Is that kind of, because this committee has talked about Senator Newman, other members of this committee. Uh, it has been our effort to get more, uh, to do that, to fund it, and to do things with it. So um, we appreciate the work you do, but I think um, the efforts that we've been making are exactly that. Uh, to help make sure that you have good staffing. Main thing, realizing again, that special revenue account, people are paying fees for the service. And in return, they should get the level of service and meet those needs. So um, I want to be sure that, um, want to comment to you that uh, we have been, will continue to be, and uh, ideas you may have on how to make that better are always appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question, um, if I remember correctly in your commentary, there was a problem you still didn't, the agency doesn't seem to feel that uh, third party testing should be done by anyone but government agencies. Is that a, is that a fair statement? Mr. Benner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Osmond, uh, yes, we feel that uh, testing should only be done by the, by the state. Sir Osmond. Um, so I'm sort of confused because um, one of my cool part-time jobs is uh, I drive a big yellow bus once a day, and uh, I took the test, I took the written test at a service center, which, by the way, it was, actually wasn't a bad experience. I went in and got on the list, and they gave me, and my phone went beep when it was time to go in. It was great. It was, Actually, wasn't bad. I went and went to Home Depot and spent too much money. That be, being aside, um, when I went to do the driving test, that was performed by the owner of the bus company. So right now, we do allow third-party testing by non-government officials. Obviously, they're licensed, but this does not was not done at a service center. This was done by a private school bus company. So I guess I put the question to you. If, if we do this and allow this for a commercial, for a, uh, this happens to be a class B license for the school bus certification, if we allow that for commercial drivers, why shouldn't we allow that for just your average residential person who just wants to get a driver's license? Why shouldn't we allow that to have the same level of ability? Mr. Banner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Osmek, so uh, I'll, I'll, work back, I'll work backwards here. So uh, remember the context of passing that, uh, that change to allow bus drivers to take uh, their tests by a third party by the bus driving company, uh, that was to address a shortage of bus drivers, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and unfortunately, since that has happened, there is still a shortage of bus drivers, uh, a massive one. Uh, and un uh, unfortunately, it just does not seem to appear that that barrier to entry was the thing that was going to solve it. Uh, and I, I think I'm not stepping uh, out of my place here to say that uh, myself and other of our partners and other unions who do represent bus drivers, I don't believe AFSCME Council 5 represents any anymore, 
um, they would like increased pay and hourly school worker UI so they have that coverage over the summer um, to make sure that they can come back in the fall but they still have some level of income to cover it because it's so inconsistent right now that people will just leave because as I'm sure you know bus driving also the, the routes are sort of irregular for school drivers or school bus drivers um, so as for the rest for CDLs and for class D's um, we just see a significant conflict of interest um, if you allow people to sell a product where they say you will get your CDL or you will get your class D license uh, and we will provide well, we will perform the test and there is not an objective person to proctor that exam necessarily there, there would need to be a whole lot of oversight there because the state does not have a vested interest in making sure people get on the roads uh, necessarily like if they are not prepared to do it if they can't uh, if they can't do uh, pass the road exam uh, then they should be failed because passing that road exam means uh, that they are competent enough to drive off the lot and to begin work or driving as a young person Thank you, Mr. Benner. I'm just going to comment since we're talking about third party testing and school buses. I just want to comment how great of a bill that was. I think that was done by me, authored by me, but I just want to comment. It wasn't a shortage of drivers. The problem was they weren't getting enough testing. The testing, they could not be done in a time frame. So they were losing drivers to that because they didn't have, they couldn't get uh, testing at the state. So they were losing drivers because of that. It wasn't the shortage of drivers. They couldn't get in to get tested in time and we're losing them to other professions with the, the whole economy going on, which was happening in all kinds of different fields. So we did it that way. But I think it's proved to be very good. We've gotten very positive feedback on third party testing for school bus drivers. Uh, so uh, with that, Senator Osmond. Well, uh, I totally forgot that you were involved, Senator Jasinski. <laughs> And you got your commercial in. <laughs> well, you know. Um, so when you have the chair spot, you get to take a couple <laughs> privileges. Yes, you do. Um, so I, I guess I'll just say I just seem to see a double standard here. That um, you know, we in both cases there were shortages, or at least perceived shortages. And uh, I can understand that there might be some reticence to having the having agencies have the ability to test after they sell a program. I guess there's a little bit of concern there. Uh, other states, if I remember correctly, do do this. Uh, it's not groundbreaking from what I remember, but you know, if if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. And I'm not familiar with any problems with school bus drivers at this point in time. Uh, seems to me we're getting more competent ones on the road. There is still a shortage. I should be on my bus right now, but I'm not. And Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in the afternoon because of my legislative duties. But um, I just think that the argument here that you know we sh we could it's okay to do it with school bus drivers who are responsible for the lives of children inside of a school bus but at the same time not be able to do it through a third party vendor when, and granted they are also responsible for lives, I'll, I'll, I'll agree to that. I just seem to see, see, to see there's a double standard here based upon my layman's evaluation, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Osmick. Again, we have two more bills, so I'm gonna move this on. Uh, we do have another uh, testifier that wish to speak. Any other questions for Mr. Benner before I call the next testifier? Seeing none, uh, we have Mr. Rich Newmeister, I believe, and again, a reminder, we do have two more bills, so I'll give you about three minutes, and we'll continue on with uh, our other bills. So, Mr. Newmeister, if you could introduce yourself for the record and state who you represent. Mr. Chairman, my name is Rich Newmeister, and for decades, I've just represent myself, and in some ways, the public, I think, with the feedback I get. <laughs> Anyways, to the bill is on page 14 of the Delete Everything Amendment, on lines 1431 through 33, and then on page 15, lines 15.3 through 15.5. Being around here a long time, Mr. Chairman, I'm aware of 10 years ago when a number of public employees and law enforcement officials decided to uh, peek into where people's driver's license and some of their private data. And so when I see this section amended, I think about, well, what does that do from that accountability? Because 10 years ago, it was a big scandal and laws were put in place that you be disciplined if you do that. So this language and the language also in 3680 raises some concerns for me that if that happens, 
Will there be able to be the quick discipline that's important when people who are in trust access private data on individuals? Now, there are two kinds of systems of how people get access. One is COPS through the BCA system. So I don't know if this a law will apply if COPS are caught, and I've seen many disciplines over the last 10 years where that's happened. And secondly, about state and public employees. Do they go through this system? So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's not to you know, decide to do language now and all that, but it's just something that I give, particularly someone who's been around a long time, some institutional memory that we don't want to come back again where all of a sudden we're seeing people peek and do things that are not intended to do, and then they, they got some rights. But, you know, let's see what the impact of that is. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that's my two cents. I really appreciate it. And as always, we've, with Senator Newman, I've always had an open regard for him, and he's been helpful in listening to what I have to say sometimes. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Newmeister. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak on this bill? Seeing no one back up to the commissioner, I believe Senator Carlson, you're in line. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a question that I, I guess I just need a little bit of comfort with. And uh, probably the best place to look at it is uh, Section 11, uh, where it talks about the uh, pre-preparing a, uh, uh, a system where you, you can uh, find out what documents you need for uh, applying for a uh, real ID or a compliant ID card. And I'm wondering, do, you know, I don't see the uh, notation that an enhanced driver's license is kept, uh, is under the same requirement. And I'm wondering if we have missed something there or if, uh, for instance, driver's license is it included by default in uh, any description of driver's license. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the bulk of this provision is intended to mirror the current process for real I the real ID pre-application. I'm not sure if there's an EDL pre-application. Maybe Mr. Zhang could, could testify about that. Um, so this is just sort of intended to mimic the current process. And if there is one for EDL, then I guess maybe we could talk about whether that needs to be amended in. Mr. Zhang. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'll have to, I want to confirm this because I hate to misspeak on this. Uh, my understanding is that the, the driver's license, the pre-application does apply to all the driver's license um, um, options online. Uh, but let me, let me circle back with that and I, I'll get you the exact information on what, what um, pre-application opportunities there are for customers right now. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Thank you. Any follow-up? Thank you, Thank Senator you. Carlson. Anyone else? I'm seeing no one else. Senator Newman, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, uh, as you're aware, this is, this is a working document right now, and uh, we will do our best to work with DPS to uh, answer some of the questions and the concerns as we're going forward. The bill uh, is to be laid over. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I would request it be laid over at this time. Uh, thank you, Senator Newman. Senator, Senate file 3582 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Uh, next up, Senate file number 3610, Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Senator, Chair. Senator, Senate file 3610. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you touched on it just briefly in your last bill, but uh, Senate file 3610 brings forward recommendation number nine from the independent expert review. Uh, it simply removes the requirement for a person 
uh, over 21 years of age with a valid driver's license in another state from needing to uh, take the written driving test, uh, including the uh, motorcycle endorsement. And if I recall the testimony on your bill, Mr. Chair, Mr. Zhang said DPS uh, does not oppose this, uh, this provision. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Any questions from any members? Okay, uh, there are no questions. Senator Pratt, any final comments before we lay your bill over? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to thank Senator Housley for co-sponsoring the bill with me. Thank you, Senator Pratt. With that, Senate File 3610 is laid over. Next on the uh, uh, agenda is Senate File 2898. That would be Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a Senate file number 2898. Uh, this is a bill for appropriations for our state patrol uh, for aviation-based uh, equipment. Uh, as you have recently seen the last couple years uh, with what's happening in, the, in uh, the metro area as well as rural Minnesota, how important law enforcement tools are. Uh, what this bill does is fund some new aircraft for the state patrol. Uh, even recently, I know there was a heat campaign that's happening this summer. Uh, there's been uh, more and more carjackings. Uh, I had the fortunate uh, evening to go up one evening and spend a, a night in the state patrol helicopter to see really how important uh, and how uh, great of a tool our aircraft are for patrolling our highways and roads in Minnesota. Uh, so what this bill would do, uh, would appropriate $38 million uh, for three new helicopters and $7.1 million uh, for three airplanes. Uh, the airplanes we currently have right now, uh, we have a 2019 Bell 407, which was the most uh, recent helicopter that we uh, funded. We funded that in, I believe, 2018. That's referred to as Trooper 9. We have a 2005 Bell 407, which has been in the fleet quite some time and uh, needs more and more maintenance these days. We also have a 2015 Cirrus uh, SR-22, uh, which is uh, very valuable as well, a 2019 Cessna 182, a 1981 Cessna 182, and a 1982 Cessna 182. Uh, the 81 and 82 Cessnas are uh, becoming very old. Uh, a lot of maintenance is required on these, uh, and are definitely towards the end of their useful life. Uh, the proposed new Bell 429 helicopters are twin engine, which is uh, much more safer. Uh, they're faster, they have hoist capabilities, uh, and they require 35% less maintenance. Uh, the, helico or the airplanes uh, are the new uh, Cirrus type brand. Uh, they, uh, all these dollar amounts uh, include the airframe, the equipment, which is usually one of the more expensive portions of that to equip these with forward-looking infrared, uh, thermal imaging, uh, and then outfitting with a hangar, insurance, and training. So uh, that's what's going on. I think it's a very, very important tool. Uh, carjacking, search and rescue, uh, not only in the metro, but rural Minnesota. I know there's been several examples. I think this summer, uh, actually, uh, blood was transferred uh, for uh, someone that saved their lives. Uh, and if the trooper was up patrolling uh, traffic, uh, that would not have happened. So this allows uh, a second and, th and third uh, backup helicopters. And again, when you have a helicopter up, uh, it may be up, but it needs a lot of maintenance on the, on the downtime. So uh, updating our fleet of aircraft will really increase the tools we have uh, for our law enforcement here, and I think they're just a great investment uh, to help Minnesota stay safe. Uh, so with that, I have our Colonel Langer, uh, head of the State Patrol, who would like to testify here. Uh, so I, Mr. Chair, I would turn it over to my testifier, Colonel Matt Langer. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Colonel Langer uh, is online. I can, I can see you, Colonel. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thanks for having me today. My name is Matt Langer. I have the honor and privilege of serving as chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. I don't need to recover the same ground that Senator Jasinski uh, offered in his opening comments. He's asked questions and we've responded to put him in a good position to speak with uh, some degree of authority on the State Patrol's fleet of aviation assets. But 
Uh, suffice to say that the twin engine helicopters, and you do have a subject matter expert uh, more than any of us with Senator Lang on, on the committee uh, serving as a pilot himself, the twin engine is faster. Uh, it can fly somewhat higher. It has a hoist, which is a significant advantage for the rescue capability that we do across primarily the northern part of our state with the Boundary Water Canoe area. Uh, and it also has some significant advantages in, in that twin engine platform that it is safer, uh, faster, and also is more efficient because it requires 35% less maintenance, which means it can spend more time in the air and less time in the hangar having maintenance done. Um, I think the, the Cirrus platform, we have one of those. Uh, of course, it's made in Minnesota, which is a great uh, advantage. We were the first uh, agency to receive the perception platform of the SR-22. That's proven to be very helpful for us. It flies safely, it's efficient, it can uh, fly fast and get around the state really well. So one of the questions that we often uh, get is that our aviation assets, are they only metro based and, and they aren't? Uh, we have a hangar in Brainerd and we have a hangar in St. Paul. The bulk of our work does happen in St. Paul, but with any um, revision of our fleet or turnover of our fleet, we hope to have better assets also stationed in Brainerd, Minnesota, so that we can service the entire state and not just be centered on the metropolitan area. That said, I think I've mentioned already previously in your committee as I wrap up my brief comments that I think right now with the number of pursuits that we see on our roads, uh, the carjacking issue, not to mention the traffic safety issue, it seems that one of the things that we can do right now is to fly more because it's proven to be really advantageous. We get great support from the chiefs and sheriffs across the metro in the state of Minnesota that they want to see us up in the air flying more because it is the one thing that we can do right now uh, to apprehend people as safely as possible and not put undue risk onto anyone else uh, using the road. So that's exactly what we intend to do right now. We've had great support through the Chiefs and Sheriffs Associations and their membership. And we're in the data collection phase as we speak wrapping up this week to see how and when we buy more. So it's a really timely conversation to be talking about our fleet, in particular the, the aircraft that are just old and need, need to go down the road. Um, and so uh, that, Mr. Chair and members, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Colonel Langer. Uh, and in particular, Colonel, uh, could you give us a little bit more information on uh, law enforcement's position regarding using both helicopters and, and, the, uh, and the airplanes uh, in protecting the public uh, from the high-speed chases, which are so often uh, dangerous, and maybe give us some examples as to uh, uh, the advantage of, of using airplanes and hangar and, uh, and helicopters rather than being involved in high-speed chases. Colonel Langer. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, a great question. So our pursuit policy for the state patrol requires that troopers discontinue the pursuit when there's an aviation asset overhead of that pursuit. Uh, that's for good reason and it's proven to be quite successful. Uh, nothing is 100% successful, but if we have a helicopter or an airplane over that pursuit that has a lock on the vehicle who, uh, whose driver has decided to flee, by having our ground units back off and, and resume normal patrol, they shift their thinking into, a into being more strategic and using the technology in the aircraft, whether it's a helicopter or a fixed wing, they're able to guide ground units in and apprehend people uh, with, with uh, really incredible precision. So pilots over our 10 days of the, of the recent heat project were involved with the apprehension of 14 people. Uh, just a couple examples. One of them was uh, a, an individual and a passenger who actually were fleeing from Robbinsdale and Golden Valley police officers. Um, I can't remember which agency specific, perhaps both involved. Uh, those individuals shot at the police and before that pursuit ended, both uh, fled and we were able to help with the helicopter, guide ground units in, recovered a gun that was ditched behind a garage in a residential area and also apprehended the individual who ditched that gun after firing at the police. Uh, another example was a, an individual that was driving 90 miles an hour past a state trooper. Uh, the pursuit began, the helicopter became uh, overhead because they were up anyway. The pursuit was discontinued. That individual was followed all the way to North Minneapolis and this started in the southern half part of the metro. Uh, followed that individual up to North Minneapolis. They uh, ended up getting out of the vehicle, going into a bar changing clothes and trying to come out and with great 
coordination between the, the State Patrol and the Minneapolis Police Department were able to apprehend uh, the individuals involved in that case. So just a couple of examples over the past couple of weeks where our pilots have done just a phenomenal job coordinating with the ground units, whether they're state troopers or local police officers or sheriff's deputies that doing our best to apprehend the people who are making poor decisions. And Colonel Langer, is it or would it be correct that the use of uh, helicopters uh, are useful in both the rural and metro area? Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, absolutely. So both have different advantages. Um, as pilots will tell you, the, the Cirrus is actually our fastest aircraft and it can fly into known icing conditions. That's, a, that's an advantage depending on the mission. The helicopters are better for um, some of the urban areas because they're a little bit more nimble and can stop and look from a vantage point and turn around that faster than an aircraft when you're looking at from the, from the, from the uh, vantage point of the air, airframe down to the ground, you wanna be able to move around houses and buildings a little bit quicker. So um, I wish I could say that, that you know, one was better than the other, but both are actually really important depending on the mission that's being requested. And as you pointed out in greater Minnesota also, um, the Cirrus has proven to be really beneficial from a search capabilities so it can it can launch and get into northern Minnesota the boundary waters or southwest Minnesota with relative ease um, the disadvantage of course is you're not going to rescue anyone with the fixed wing aircraft whereas the helicopter is, is how we do re search and rescue people so uh, depends on the mission and, and what we're trying to accomplish but both are, are really helpful thank you Colonel uh, members any questions for Colonel Langer I do not see any. Thank you, Colonel Langer, for your testimony. Uh, I have got a request for Mr. Neumeister uh, to testify. Please come to the testifying table. Identify yourself, Mr. Neumeister. Mr. Chairman, and, my name is Rich uh, Neumeister. Proceed with your testimony. Um, as we all know, uh, with Alex Please give us your name first, for oh, the record. For the, my name is Rich Neumeister. Uh, with helicopters and airplanes across the country, communities have been discussing the issues of how close they come, what are they doing with high-tech, surveillance, all those kinds of issues. There have been mapping of communities with law enforcement, aerial devices from drones to planes. There's also been use of uh, uh, mapping communities, surveillance, infrared, and with the State Patrol, which has been in the news a lot with some of these activities, and I'm not judging whether it's right or wrong, I think it's important to have some discussion with the State Patrol, particularly if you're going to have buy another three, of, three, three more of these devices. So I would like to suggest somehow some language, uh, this will be laid over in appropriations, that some type of report be brought back to you next year to sort of say, hey, these are some of the guidelines that we're going to do if we're going to do surveillance and where privacy comes into play, what we should not do, what we can do, or whatever. I, I just think it's important for rules and guidelines with uh, law enforcement and technology. And I think, Mr. Chairman, of when drones first came to was being discussed and Senator Dibble's point and I still think all these years later he put he posted on social media a net going over some some smurfs and the sheriff's association said oh there cannot be such thing and all that but we all know that is that has not been the case as years have gone on drones now can project uh, nets Taser, you know, I mean, the technology is there. And I have no problem with just discussing it and seeing what policymakers and the public, should there be some guidelines. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I thank you very much just for my, my word or two. Thank you, Mr. Neumeister. Uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Mr. Neumeister is correct. I did post that image. <laughs> but it was in direct response to testimony from the representative of a law enforcement professional association who uh, advocated for drones to be able to 
throw nets over people and crowds of people. So we thought that was a pretty surprising position for that individual to take and just, you know, wanted to let folks know. So. Thank you, Senator so. Dibble. Any other comments from uh, anyone? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just a question. Senator Jasinski, we're not expanding the, the, the aircraft for the state troopers we're just replacing right we're not expanding and add, adding additional aircraft are we senator jasinski mr chow mr chair and senator howe uh what would happen is we're increasing the fleet but any uh aircraft that would be traded in that money would go back into it so i can't remember the exact number i know the the cessna the two 182s need what needed to be replaced i'm sorry my notes here uh so those would be traded uh the 2019 bell I'm sorry, the 2005 Bell would probably be traded because that would be upgraded. Uh, the Cirrus, the 2015 Cirrus would be kept. So there would be one additional, I think, if you add, add and subtract all the ones, but I want to make sure in the beginning of the bill, it does say any uh, uh, aircraft that is traded in on a new one, that money goes back into the general fund to offset this cost. So I th they think it is an increase in one aircraft uh, because of the helicopter and just having those three, because those are the most really crucial uh, because the other two are, are rel relatively new. So I think it's an increase of one. Uh, uh, Colonel Langer may be able to correct that if I'm wrong, but I believe it's an increase in one aircraft. Senator Hall. Senator Osmond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a point of clarification, Senator Dibble, you posted something with Smurfs on it. Was it Papa Smurf? And <laughs> Sen <laughs> Senator Dibble is nodding his head. <laughs> Senator no, it's, Dibble. It's still out there. We can find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Papa Smurf might have been in there. Yeah, I just want to make sure it my never goes away. Mr. Chairman, I was just trying to make sure my ears were hearing the, the what, what had just happened on the other end of the table. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't see any other uh, questions or comments from any members. Uh, and just so you know, members, that, that this bill will also be laid over. Uh, Senator Jasinski, any final comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, great discussion. Again, I, I just think this is such an important tool. Uh, again, I was pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to go up and, and actually see how this tool is used and uh, the safety, uh, not only with our, our law enforcement, uh, but with our citizens on the ground, I think is huge and something to think about. And uh, I wish traffic or I wish uh, crime was going down, but it's not. So I think uh, anything we can do to curb that and uh, make sure our citizens are safe in Minnesota is a positive thing that we can do for our citizens and taxpayers. So thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. With that, Senate file 2898 is laid over. <coughs> Members, that completes our agenda uh, for today. And uh, not seeing any comments, so we are adjourned.